thus far, we've learned that aerobic cellular respiration can give you a whole lot of adenosine triphosphate, but it only works in the presence of oxygen. So for the, this, this mini session, uh, this mini lecture, we're going to go over what happens when there's no oxygen. And we'll talk about two distinct processes, anaerobic cellular respiration and fermentation. And please remember, these are two totally different processes. Fermentation, and then there is anaerobic cellular respiration, both of which occur without oxygen, and that's about where the similarities end. So pay attention. You got this. We're going to start with fermentation. All right, so we've talked about aerobic reactions. What is an aerobic reaction again? Requires oxygen. But you don't have oxygen in all cases. In this case, there are anaerobic reactions like fermentation. In cellular respiration, we took one molecule of ATP and produced, I'm sorry, one molecule of glucose and produced a ton of ATP. Roughly how much ATP was made from one molecule of glucose? 30, 34, 36 sometimes. So a lot. The big takeaway is a lot of ATP was made. Um, but we absolutely needed oxygen. There are, though, cases where we might not have oxygen. There are cases where there's um, no mitochondria. Where might there not be any mitochondria? What organisms would have no mitochondria? Prokaryotes. So prokaryotes absolutely lack those uh, internal compartments. So they cannot undergo aerobic cellular respiration. Yes? It's okay. Turns out there are going to be some eukaryotes that lack mitochondria. Um, just because. Well, we, no, no, no. Humans have mitochondria. We absolutely do. But um, you guys you remember endosymbiosis theory? So, with endosymbiosis theory, there were cells that had a nucleus. Some of those cells were able to take in a brown algae that became the mitochondrion. Does that make sense? That means that there are still other ones that had a nucleus, but no mitochondria. So they evolved separate than this other group. And this group just did really, really fantastically well, so much to the point that we just figured out that some cells don't have them a few years ago. <clears throat> yes? There are lots and lots and lots of subgroups for eukaryotes. That's called uh, taxonomy. It's something we'll study in 102 and something that drives me crazy because they keep changing it. Taxonomy. Taxidermy is different than taxonomy. Yeah. Ta ta you're talking about taxidermy. Taxonomy is the science of classifying organisms. Um, we can exist in a world that has no oxygen. There are times where you have no oxygen, or, or you might not. Um, if you're underwater for a while, what happens to you? You drown. You die. Why? Because you lack oxygen. But there are obviously some organisms that can survive through those conditions. Has anybody ever done any canning by chance? All right, if you just you. That's okay. That's yeah. No, it's all right. Just, it's only you. It's okay. Where I used to work, everybody did, because um, you know you have to survive the winter. Um, with canning, you want to remove as much oxygen as possible. So the only things that can survive in there are the anaerobic organisms. With fermenting beer, you don't want oxygen there. You guys did a fermentation experiment already, right? Yeah. What was the point? You had to get rid of that bubble. You had to get rid of the oxygen. So in order for these organisms to survive, the ones without oxygen or the ones that um, have no mitochondrion, they need to have a very fast and simple solution. Fermentation is an anaerobic process that's fast and simple, which is why I put up a picture of the Roadrunner, because he's both fast and simple. Um, and I know it's weird because I put this up and most people are like, I have no idea what that is. And then I feel, re I know, and then I feel super old and it sucks. Right. Okay. As long as you guys know, <laughs> I appreciate it. There was a, um, a, a sign out in Arizona that said, um, coyotes live here. Um, you don't have to, it was the police. They put out a sign that says coyotes live here. You don't have to put out a sign. Uh, you don't have to call us. To tell us a coyote is present. Here are the uh, steps you take to avoid coyotes. And it said, however, 
if the coyote is carrying a rocket or on skates or uh, is dropping an anvil, then you should call us. And I appreciate that. What you do is you do nothing. Eventually it will hit something, it'll bounce right back in it. You stay out of the way. So fermentation converts glucose to energy without the need for other organelles. It's very, very simple and efficient. It is a two-step process. And the wonderful part for you guys is you already know half of it. You literally know the entire first step. It's just glycolysis again. The second step is a little bit more involved, but it's only one step. It's waste product formation. So step one, glycolysis. I'm just gonna draw it back up on the board. We take what molecule, not trying to trick you, glucose. You take glucose and you break it in half to produce what? 2-pyruvate. And I'll put a box around it. All right? What is that released? You've broken a bond, right? So a net total of two ADP go in and two ATP come out. Two NAD plus go in and two NADH come out. Plus. All right, so that's glycolysis. Questions on that? Now, that pyruvate for the next step can go on to become lots and lots and lots of different things. Um, if it was uh, exposed to a propionic bacterium, you end up producing propionic acid and carbon dioxide. That's what gives Swiss cheese its bite. In case you didn't know, most of the cheeses and fermented things we have are made because of their interactions with microorganisms. Swiss cheese is well known because of what? The holes in it. So the holes in Swiss cheese are caused by bubbles of carbon dioxide. If you were to slice the uh, cheese, you know, you slice into a bubble, that's how you get a hole. Um, if it was exposed to uh, lactobacillus, we, uh, we looked at lactobacillus in class. We took yogurt cultures and looked at those bacteria. If it's exposed to lactobacillus, it gives you the bite of lactic acid. Lactic acid is also what makes sour gummy worms sour. Um, lactic acid. It, well, most uh, things that you eat, if you read the chemical formula for, or the chemical names of it, don't sound healthy. Dihydrogen uh, monoxide. I mean, it sounds terrifying, but it's water. So it's like uh, Saccharomyces. Saccharomyces are yeast. We use yeast for uh, producing ethanol and bread. Thanks, you're the good one. Um, clostridium. Clostridium, uh, if you're exposed to clostridium, instead of making ethanol, you might accidentally make nail polish. Uh, I'm sorry, nail polish remover, rubbing alcohol. Or an actobacter, or like E. coli, they go in on to produce uh, acetic acid, uh, which we have in vinegar. This is the waste product. Oh, okay. So they're, they're doing this to make energy things off, and then they develop this, and then they use it. That's precisely what happens, and then we eat their waste products. That's exactly it. Um, do you guys know anybody that's ever tried to brew beer or something like that? All right. So this gets fun. Um, they, were always, they were so proud of themselves, too, when they first decanted it, weren't they? They're like, you've got to try this, and they handed it to you, and you thought about it, and you're thinking... Maybe I shouldn't. Um, few things happen to people who brew beer. Um, one, if somebody hands you a beer that they've brewed, you need to trust that they did this with a very clean technique. That is, they were worried about the microbiology involved. A lot of times they aren't, but if they didn't wash their hands often enough, instead of yeast being produced, I'm sorry, yeast being used, it may be that they got an E. coli in there that turned all of their sugar in the beer into vinegar. It happens. Um, if they did it wrong, you may end up with a uh, nail polish remover instead of alcohol. This is what happened to a lot of the moonshiners. Right. 
Exactly. So th- th- you know a lot about this. Um, so with the, with moonshining, if there was a small mistake, it could make people go blind or it could kill them. In fact, this just recently happened. There was a, there was a news article about this. Huh. Maybe you guys, one of you guys should find it for your journal. But there's a news article that in India, there were a group of people that were moonshining, and I think it was like 45 people were killed from it. Yeah, that was recent. Yeah. That was like a week or two weeks ago. So, there, because the next article is going to be about this stuff. No problem, that's what I'm here for you. You know what, I'm fine with that. So you've got to be careful about um, when you're fermenting something to make sure you do it with a clean technique. You don't want to contaminate your samples. The first type of fermentation I want to talk about is a model that I think you all are familiar with, which is yeast. Yeast is going to take that glycolysis phase, break down pyruvate into a waste product. And the waste product in this case is going to be ethanol. So you're going to take pyruvate, you're going to cut off two carbon dioxides, and that makes ethanol. In the process, and this is the whole point of fermentation, you're going to convert NADH back to NAD+. Because that NAD+, is a rate-limiting step. It's a rate-limiting reactant. Does it go into entropy? It's not because of entropy. It, you're, you're effectively creating a cycle here. Do you see what I'm saying? you're going to recover that energy when you break that CO2. Do you see what I'm saying? So you're using that bond break to get that back. C6 H12O6 is glucose. Not really, no. Yes? This is what yeast does. Takes the pyruvate, cuts off carbon dioxide, and produces ethanol. So it's turning NADH back to NAD+. Because without NAD+, you don't get any ATP. Yes? Yep, yeast cuts carbon dioxide off, recovers NAD+, and produces ethanol. What is, what is, uh, is E. coli has another pathway that cuts something else off to create, um, uh, not methanol. It creates, what was it I said ethanol created? It's, it's like nail polish remover. Okay. Yeah, it's some bad stuff. Oh, no, E. coli creates vinegar. It makes acetic acid. It cuts something else off to make acetic acid. Yes? I think so. If it's not, it's not. There is? Okay. So that's the whole process. Now, this is kind of important and cool because um, we use these waste products. Carbon dioxide we use in breads. Carbon dioxide is what makes bread rise. Um, we put yeast. Nope, it's carbon dioxide. Well, it's the carbon dioxide from the yeast in bread. If you're talking about the baking soda in like cookies, that, that's where that works. But in bread, you add yeast, and the yeast um, activates to produce carbon dioxide and um, waste. Actually, a little bit of ethanol. It goes away when you cook it. The ethanol is the waste. Have you guys ever baked bread before? Okay. Now, when you're baking bread, see if we can tie this into some other things we've talked about. You're making bread. You take it and you beat it up for a while. You put yeast in there. Then what do you do with it after you've put all the ingredients together? You put it right in the oven? You let it sit, right? Yeah. At a warm temperature. Oh, you so got this. That's exactly it. So you put it at warm temperature. <laughs> You, you put it at a warm temperature. You put it somewhere where it's nice and warm. Um, and what that ends up doing is producing, uh, as it gets warmer, you have higher kinetic energy, so you have more reactions happening. So there's more carbon dioxide made. There's more of that sugar that's broken down. What else do you do with it? And do you just like leave it in the bowl and put it somewhere to do its thing? Yeah, you, cover you cover it. Why do you cover it? No, it's not the humidity. That's it. What about the environment around it you don't want it to react with? And this is important. Oxygen. You cover it in order to stop oxygen from interacting with it.
because the yeast are going to go undergo aerobic cellular respiration until they don't have any oxygen. You cover it up, suddenly it starts doing this whole fermentation thing really quickly. I made a mistake once. I was like, I know, I was like, I'm a biologist, I got this. I just need to completely seal it off so that it doesn't get any oxygen. So I took saran wrap and I wrapped the bread. Oh, I'm sorry, I wrapped the dough. Okay, then I set it someplace warm. So what happened? Why? You're right. It absolutely popped. It got bigger. Why did it get bigger? The fermentation produced what? Not oxygen. CO2, exactly. So it's building up this big CO2 bubble. Um, no, it just popped. But I do have some fun explosion stories. Um, as far as CO2 buildup goes, you've, you guys some, know some people who've tried to brew stuff, right? As they're brewing, the first mistake most people make is they don't have a release valve. That is something to release the carbon dioxide. So they have this big steel drum or this big metal drum that they filled with sugar and yeast and water. And they're reacting and producing a lot of carbon dioxide. So what happens to the pressure in it? It expands and expands and expands until what happens? It explodes. So there we go. Um, another fun story. I had a group, uh, I had two students who, they told this story, so I thought it was very fun. Um, you guys know what eggnog is, right? All right, so eggnog obviously has a bunch of sugar in it. Yeah? So they, um, they had this eggnog and it was sitting for a while. And you guys have probably done this too. You've had bad milk and you've, uh, you've found bad milk, right? That's the worst, isn't it? Because you always find bad milk when you're eating cereal. It's, 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 you go, you go to the refrigerator, you pull out the milk, you pour it into the cereal. It doesn't clump, because if it clumped, you wouldn't bite, bite it. But it pours in, and you take a bite, and you're like, is it the cereal, or is it me? And you have to think about it, and you're like, I'm going to take one more bite, because it might have been the cereal. And it's not, and you're like, great, now I'm drinking, eating spoiled milk. So you get rid of it all. What do you do with the milk? Right, that's what you should do. That is actually what you should do, but that's apparently not what I do. No, I don't want to deal with that right then. Um, so what I do is I put it back in the refrigerator. Um, no, no, I do that. And I'm, I know not to drink it. I put it in the back of the fridge. Forget it. Where it is. That's what happens, right? So you, has anybody ever forgotten an old milk in the fridge? No. Yeah, okay, thanks. All right, for those of you who have, what happens to the container? It doesn't explode, luckily. If you look at, you know, a, a gallon of milk, how it has those little bumps in it on the side? Yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. They expand out. That's one reason you have those bumps. So you know definitely when not to drink it. Um, so I tend to get rid of it at, at, at the point where I, I, I want to get it out at trash day. Because I don't want to open it. It's disgusting. I'll puke if I see the little chunks coming out in the sink. You know what I'm talking about? Oh, yeah. It's, yeah, it's, something, yeah, it's terrible. I don't want to see it. I just want to throw it away. So... Um, I have never had it explode, but two of my students, they were get, they had eggnog over Christmas. They had it in their fridge. Come, um, oh, it was, they said it was Easter. Easter rolled, yeah, right? Easter rolls around, they're like, oh, that eggnog's still in there. It was in a closed container. So they, they took it out of the fridge, and they're like, we have to take this to the dump. They didn't live somewhere they could just throw their trash on the curb and somebody takes it away. So um, they put it in their car with all the rest of their trash. Their nice, warm car. So what's happening to inside that container? Fermentation, heat, kinetic energy. It's moving faster. So they're driving along the highway. Not the highway. They're driving the back roads because they're going to the dump. And they hit a pothole. And that pothole was just enough extra energy to snap the already strained bonds of the, um, the, the container. And they had a geyser of spoiled eggnog. Oh yeah. That, at that point, there was no point trying to recover the car. It will smell like spoiled eggnog forever. Yeah. All because of CO2 buildup from ethanol. Okay, so I put milk back in the fridge because I know that I can't take it, I'm not gonna pour it down the sink because I don't want the, um, to puke. And I want to get it into the trash. Well, trash day is coming in a few days. Close it quick. Look, you're just like my wife. You're just like.
That also could be a good idea. That never happens. Sidebar, do you guys do the whole, huh, I think this tastes bad. You should try it. Yeah, that, that's, that's a horrible thing to do to people. All right, so yes. No, it was in a, in a plastic container. Oh, yeah, but it was on top, and you can't really close those bags all. You guys know a trash bag. You can't close them all the way. Yeah. Um, so we, we produced ethanol. Uh, we got there through breaking down glucose to pyruvate. That pyruvate then breaks down into the waste product of ethanol. Questions? Seems a lot easier than that uh, aerobic cellular respiration, right? Yes. Same thing I've been going over. Yeah, I've been saying the same thing like for the past 15 minutes. Please. The energy from breaking the CO2 makes the NADH go back into NADH. Yeah, so the big thing is we have to recover this NAD+. So we're using that CO2, that NADH has a highly energetic electron, right? So between the product of the pyruvate and the energy from the NADH, you're able to produce the ethanol, which has a lot of energy in it. And that gives us that NAD+. We have to have NAD+, to power, and it's not even powering, in order for this reaction to happen. Correct. Because you're transferring that energy to that molecule. Oh, wait. Okay, so when you... That has a lot of energy. So think about ethanol, right? What have you heard as far as ethanol is used to do what? You don't know? Uh, obviously, alcoholic beverages, but forget that. Okay. Have you heard of um, cars powered by ethanol? Oh, yeah. 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 Yes. That's where they get their power. Oh, okay. So a lot of energy is changed. Yeah. So fermentation produces uh, 30 to 34 ATP. And actually, you ne this is a, uh, usually I put this on the exam. Um, fermentation produces 30 to 34 ATP. Glyco uh, the fermentation, I'm sorry, cellular respiration produces 30 to 34 ATP. Fermentation produces two. So where's the rest of the energy? It's in the process, but where is it here? That's exactly right. You store the energy in the bonds of the waste product. Isn't it very, very combustible? Partly, but it more because it's got a ton of bonds in it. So you got lots and lots of bonds. They're not unstable, no. Yeah, well, you're burning this energy like crazy. And truthfully, think about it uh, if people want to work out and lose weight. Uh, they want to lose, they want to get rid of sugar. The, you want to push yourself to the point where you're, you've used up your oxygen and you're gone, you've gone into a fermentative phase. Your muscle cells are termed uh, facultative anaerobes. We'll get to them in a second. But effectively, you're going to burn sugar very, very quickly with no oxygen because most of the energy is getting put into a waste product, oh. not into powering your reactions. Oh, yeah. okay. Another example is lactic acid fermentation. And uh, No, no, okay, as far as, this is, the, I guess, what people really want to know. What's the takeaway? The big takeaway for fermentation is you go from glucose to pyruvate, pyruvate to waste. Every single type of fermentation does the same thing. The waste is different, the thing that gets cut off is different. But the big picture is glucose, pyruvate, waste, recover NAD+. Yes, and then back. Yeah? So would you say the reason why you like, only makes two ATP is the rest is you, like how the other one, the other one of mine right now were, it makes 30 to 40. I'm sorry, could you repeat that? So would you say the reason why when fermentation only two is, 
because the other one just like like collis because all of the rest of that energy gets put into that waste product yeah, it's like, yes like the other one has oxygen and stuff pulls them together it's kind of like like a little bump right yeah that works yes brandon It absolutely is. So your muscles produce lactic acid. That is caused by fermentation. The point of both any type of fermentation is break down glucose quick, recover energy. The point of any fermentation is break down glucose quickly and put that energy into the waste product. And fermentation is the quickest way. The fermentation is the quickest, simplest way. Like Brandon noted, some cells are able to do both aerobic cellular respiration and anaerobic fermentation. Your muscle cells are facultative anaerobes. They prefer to use oxygen, but when you don't have any oxygen, they switch over to fermentation. Your cells can't undergo fermentation for long because you're building up this waste product, lactic acid. But in a pinch, you can. That's why if you start drowning, you feel a burning sensation. That's why when you work out for a long time and you're out of breath, your muscles burn. You've got lactic acid buildup. Your, the yeast that you worked with in lab are facultative anaerobes, which is why if you had a bubble at the top to begin with, an oxygen bubble, they used that oxygen first and didn't make as much... Um, make as much carbon dioxide. They didn't uh, undergo fermentation as much. So those are anaero I'm sorry, those are facultative anaerobes. There is also anaerobic respiration. That is respiration that occurs without oxygen. This is different than fermentation. Anaerobic respiration and fermentation are not the same thing. Anaerobic respiration is where you are undergoing chemiosmosis without oxygen. Fermentation uses substrate level phosphorylation, an enzyme to connect a phosphate to an enzyme. I'm sorry, a phosphate to an ADP. Chemiosmosis uses ATP synthase. So if you look, we've got a bacteria here. I can get rid of this. We've got a bacteria here that's got invaginations, like that. Sort of the membrane is folded inward. This is able to then create a hydrogen gradient in these little um, invaginations. So what happens is you have a pump that pushes hydrogen out of the cell. That pump is powered by an electron, uh, an electron transport chain, just like with aerobic cellular respiration. So you're going to have NADH drop off an electron, that electron jumps and jumps. The difference is, instead of oxygen being the final electron acceptor, um, nitrate is the final electron acceptor, and it can convert it to nitrite. Wait, so hydrogen pushed out, then nitrite comes in? Nitrite, nitrate is present, just like oxygen is present. Nitrate accepts the electron at the end, just like oxygen would, but instead of being turned into water, it's turned into nitrate. The big thing to note now, though, is yeah, it's a different electron acceptor at the end, but we've produced what here? What's that called? Lots of hydrogen. It's an electrochemical gradient. What way can these get back inside? With ATP synthase. So they go through, and that produce, converts ADP into ATP. Yes? Right. Right. But with this one, you're saying that the, instead of the ATP connecting to the nitrate, it is going back into the, the cell. ATP. Right. 
the other one, it was, the hydrogen was still going through the ATP synthase. Yeah, so. The leftover from right. Wasn't going there, Correct. Does it have anything to do with pH? You could say that the pH is constantly changing out here. The cell is pushing hydrogen out, but as m fast as it's pushing hydrogen out, that hydrogen's going back in. So the pH isn't changing much, but it's a good call to connect them. Please. It does yield less ATP. Because it comes down to what ha a, a, a relationship that happened a long, long time ago. So there was an organism a long time ago that could use, so it looks sort of like this, right? And it's pushing hydrogen across and pulling it back in. Except it was using oxygen a long time ago. What is nitrate? Nitrate's just, it's a chemical that is able uh, to donate um, electrons. So probably the reason why the oxygen one put on more sugar was more At the time, yeah. Okay. So, but bear in mind, so you've got a lot of hydrogen being pushed out here. This is a, an organism from a long, long time ago. Um, if this organism that was using oxygen as its final electron acceptor got eaten by a bigger organism, sort of like that, what have we formed if it wasn't digested? It's a double membrane bound organelle, specifically the mitochondrion. They're not mitochondria at that point. They're a different type of cell, a different type of prokaryote altogether. But if that cell would have been taken in by another cell, these things, don't exist anymore, these things exist like this is the oxygen one. This is the mitochondria. Oh, no, I'm saying the one that uses the nitrate. Okay. Those exist, but they're free living. They don't exist inside another cell oh, okay. that we know of. Okay, that, that's, sorry. It's okay. So this process happens in organisms with no organelles. We're still moving hydrogen across a gradient. This is respiration. It's just respiration that happens without oxygen. You're using nitrite as that final electron acceptor. You're still pushing all of these, the hydrogen across the gradient. You're still accepting it through ATP synthase. You're still making a lot of ATP. It's just a different method. No oxygen's involved, so it is an anaerobic process. Remember, Anaerobic respiration is very different than fermentation. Both lack oxygen, but that's the, where their similarities end. Any thoughts, any concerns? All right, so the big takeaway. In today, we've taken a molecule, glucose, our model molecule, and we've broken it down. We've broken it down several different ways and several different times. We've taken uh, this one molecule and we've cut it and every time we cut it we release energy Remember ultimately this is all about oxidizing substrates stealing electrons We take the electron and we make it do some work the work may be build ATP the work may be recover NAD plus the work may be uh, build a hydrogen ion gradient But we're taking an electron from some other molecule. We're oxidizing that molecule reducing some other molecule and making that molecule do work for us. That's what we're all about. We need to take molecules, break them down, steal their electrons, and make the electrons do work. Just to reiterate, anaerobic processes do not require oxygen. In fact, they shouldn't have oxygen present. Fermentation is one of two anaerobic processes we've talked about, and fermentation has two steps to it, glycolysis and waste product formation. The glycolysis section, just like in aerobic cellular respiration, produced two ATP and pyruvate, but it did also use up NAD plus to make NADH. So our limiting factor on that was the amount of NAD plus present. For fermentation, there's a whole extra step called waste product formation, whose job is to recover the NAD plus. Yeah, you get a waste product and there's some energy that's stuck in the waste product, but the big important thing is you get NAD plus. So this means that the results of fermentation are the production of two ATP from the same material that aerobic cellular respiration could have gotten like 30 to 34 ATP from. So it's a lot faster, 
it's a lot simpler, but it's a bit more wasteful. Now, there's some organisms out there, like facultative anaerobes, that can use oxygen for respiration, but then when there's no oxygen around, it switches to fermentation. It's like sort of an emergency backup mode. A completely separate and different process, and I cannot emphasize that enough, completely separate and different, is anaerobic respiration. And this will occur in some prokaryotes. What these prokaryotes do is they form a pocket. They invaginate their cell membrane. And into that pocket, they pump hydrogen ions. But they don't pump it out. They use the electron transport chain. But their final electron, uh, the final acceptor of the electron transport chain is not oxygen. Instead, it's nitrite. And then that nitrite becomes nitrate. So you don't need oxygen. You're still pumping hydrogen, um, in this case, out of the cell because there's no mitochondria to pump it around in. So you're pumping it right out of the cell. You've created a high um, level of hydrogen ions or protons right outside the cell. They want to get back into the cell where there's a low level, and the only way back through is through ATP synthase. So they go through ATP synthase, it spins around, and it creates um, a lot of adenosine triphosphate from adenosine diphosphate. So two processes, fermentation, and then totally separate process, anaerobic respiration. These content review questions should help focus your studies. In the next mini lecture, we're going to look at a different biological, uh, a different metabolic pathway uh, that's fairly complex called photosynthesis. So with aerobic cellular respiration, we broke down sugar to recover energy uh, in the form of ATP. In the next mini set of mini lectures, we're going to discuss how plants use the sun's light to build bonds and create sugar. So two complex biological processes, both of which are attached to each other. Um, you can see how you build sugar and then you break sugar down to get energy, and this process goes on. And without these two processes being interlinked, we really wouldn't have the world as we know it today. So stay tuned. It'll be awesome.